before um, my son Noah explodes, I think he's uh, reached his limit. So first of all, a massive thank you for, for all of you for, for joining us today. Um, I'd like to, um, well, first of all, just explain who's here. So, so first, the uh, Andre Oliveira and Brian Howes, who from the FIH have put, um, put sort of the admin together for this, um, this project. Um, plus, you'll, you'll meet everybody else um, in, in due course. Um, it's part of the FIH Academy Development Series, and uh, it's our fourth gender equality webinar, um, this time coming to you from, from Europe. Um, but uh, very much driven by the Women in Sport Committee at the FIH. Um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass over to Katie Roberts, who's a member of the Women in Sport Committee um, from England, who's going to take over from here. So, uh, Katie, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Mike, and thanks, Noah, for that little uh, handover at the end as well there. Uh, so, firstly, a warm welcome for um, everyone that's joined today. I know we have participation from across Europe and also uh, some representatives from Africa and Asia, which is fantastic. So, as Mike said, I am a member of the FIH Women in Sport Committee, uh, which is chaired by Marika Florin, who uh, needs no introduction. Um, but by way of a bit of background for me, because many of you won't know me, I'm an ex-player. Um, I played, as Mike said, for England and Great Britain. More recently, I've been on the board of uh, both England Hockey and Great Britain Hockey. But my day job is actually not in hockey at all. I'm a lawyer working for an investment bank. And it's actually in that environment um, that I've had the privilege of, be of being involved in leading and sponsoring a number of gender balance initiatives. So this is a topic that I'm passionate about. I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion today. As Mike said, the, um, this is the fourth series in a, a series of webinars hosted by the FAH in collaboration with Continental Federations, focused on topics to do with gender balance. Now, when this was discussed, the kind of idea was to bring together a diverse group of panelists and participants from across the continents in different groups to discuss topics that were particular interest and through that discussion open and honest forum actually try to help drive an increase in gender balance across our sport. So today's session um, as Mike said hosted uh, in collaboration with the um, European Hockey Federation and the FIH is um, focused on a fully gender balanced hockey administration so we are talking pretty big theme, pretty fundamental questions about what it is to be, you know, hashtag equally amazing in Europe. What does that look like and how can we all play our part? So I'm delighted that we've got Sarah Juggins uh, here with us uh, from the FIH who will be leading and moderating this session. And she will be introducing our fantastic group of special guest panellists who come from different backgrounds across the sport and will be sharing their experiences. So finally, before handing over to Sarah, um, I'd like to, uh, to thank you again for joining, for your time, um, to reiterate that if you do have questions, please do ask them. I think that this will be a, a better session and we'll all get more out of it if it is interactive. And finally, um, I just encourage you to consider, you know, your own roles as you listen to, uh, to this webinar, because you are all, uh, I know, you know, influential people in your spheres of, you know, hockey uh, life. And so, you know, we have an opportunity here. So do do consider your role and, and how you personally, whether it's through a small action or, or a larger one, could influence positive change in our sport. So I'll leave you, if you don't mind, with um, actually a quote. And um, it's a quote that I feel slightly guilty about because I didn't ask if I could use it. And it's a, it's a quote from Mareka who said, actually, in the, uh, the launch event, um, something that really resonated with me, and she said it to the participants, and so I'm, um, you know, it resonated with me, so I'd like to share it with you um, before handing over to Sarah. So in that opening remarks, Marika said, all of you have the power of change in your hands, and you can all make a difference. So with that, um, Sarah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Katie. And hello and welcome to everybody. Um, all the guests who've tuned in today, thank you for sharing your time with us. And a big thank you in particular to our panellists who are going to be uh, delving into their own personal experiences today to get some ideas. Um, before I introduce the panel, 
Um, I would just like to reiterate the purpose of this webinar today. Um, through the experiences and thoughts of our panellists, we're exploring the importance and benefits of gender balance within hockey administration at all levels. Um, everyone listening to this, uh, to this webinar should feel by the end of it that there is something, and that could be something big or it could be something very small, but things that they can take back to their own organisation or to their own way of doing things that will make a difference. Uh, we invite comments and questions in the chat facility, and I will endeavour to, in, to include these within the, within the webinar itself. Uh, although we might also tackle some of those questions offline after the webinar or with individual panellists through the chat box. But the thing is today, it's about networking, it's about listening, it's about sharing experiences, and it's about taking something away at the end of it to make this a really worthwhile experience. Uh, so now, to introduce our panellists. Um, now, the first lady I'm going to introduce, I'm going to struggle with pronouncing her surname, but we're going to go for it. Une Melo Melotaiza from Lithuania. Um, hi, Une, how are you today? Hi, I'm actually happy and I'm saying hello from the very winter land uh, from Lithuania. We already have a lot of snow and minus 15 degrees. So this is what we have back here. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, welcome to welcome to the webinar. Um, Une is a senior project manager in her day to day life, but within hockey, she was an athlete with the Lithuanian national team, um, a former member of the EHF Youth Leadership Panel, and she is currently the first female chair of Engzo Youth, which she's going to tell us about in a little while. Uh, we've also got Koen van Boom of the Netherlands, and he needs very little introduction. He's usually seen running up and down the side of line in international competitions. He's the EHF Umpire Development Coordinator and among the many EHF projects he is involved in, uh, the current very relevant piece of work involves helping develop the Ukraine and Czech Hockey's Good Governance Project. So hi Cohen, how are you today? Hi Saraya, good morning from uh, from the Netherlands where it's not that the winter uh, yet, it's more uh, it's more windy and rain here. So uh, <laughs> oh yeah, warm welcome from from Holland and I'm I'm very fun. I'm uh, I'm pleased to see so many different faces from uh, different parts of the world uh, in this webinar. So I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, to be here and uh, well I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, to discuss all the uh, topics in this in this uh, webinar. Fantastic. And then we've got Magda. Magda Nazaret is also a well-known face at international hockey competitions as she is one of the EHF's, EHF's top TDs. Magda is also an executive board member of the EHF and the Polish Hockey Federation. Welcome to you, Magda. How are you? Hello, everyone. Um, very well, thank you. I hope uh, you're all good too. Um, it's a real great pleasure and honour to be here and be able to share my story with you all. Brilliant. And you haven't actually given us a weather update from Poland. So what's happening out there today? Um, the truth is that I'm not in Poland. I am from Poland, but I live in France. So I can say that it's a really beautiful sunny day here. Fantastic. At the moment, it's France where I'd like to be most of all, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Sergio. Now, Sergio, until Noah appeared on this call, you were the youngest panellist, but Noah has now gone. So Sergio from Spain. Um, Sergio Olis is co-founder of Clubhouse Hockey App and is a marketing and communications front end developer. He's a club player, he's a volunteer and he's a member of the EHF Youth Leadership Panel. So hi, Sergio. Hola. How are you? Hola, hola a todos. Um, I'm, I'm good. Uh, here the weather, which is an important part now, uh, <laughs> uh, is, is good, it's windy, a little bit a little bit rainy. But yeah, so uh, delighted to be here and talk about the topic, which I think is a really important one today. Fantastic. Um, and just in case anyone's wondering, it's a bit blowy in England at the moment. There's a lot of wind around. But uh, So we've got that out of the way. Now we're going to talk about the really, really important thing under discussion, uh, which is gender balance within hockey administrations. And what I'm going to do, first of all, is turn to each of the panellists um, in turn and ask for a brief description of um, how it is looking in their most hockey relevant position that they're holding at the moment, how the gender balance is looking for them. So um, actually, if we come to you first, Magda, if you could just sort of give us a little bit of an outline where you are and what's happening in your world. Um, as far as Polish Hockey Association is concerned, things have changed dramatically, but in a good way uh, recently. Uh, especially since last year's uh, presidential elections, where the door have been obviously and naturally open for the women in the board. So I'm very happy to say that now we've got four women on the board of Polish hockey, and uh, this is just allowing us to, to make people aware of uh, 
how things should be to make the the environment uh, just better and healthy to 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 look to things from our perspective to to bring to the table topics that maybe were not really seen before so comparing to previous years it has been uh, it has changed into really really good brilliant and you're seeing that change instantly yeah you, there's already you can already sort of see the benefits of that change Oh yes, absolutely. Because the the fact that uh, we women on the board can um, introduce uh, can represent women from Polish hockey can introduce uh, the the subjects from the women's perspective is just so important. That the, the, this uh, was not the case for many many years. The doors were not even closed, but they were locked, and it was really a struggle to be able to make a point which is now uh, a lot easier yeah sure and, and it helps i mean there are four of you which gives you that sort of that almost that that backup doesn't it if you are make, if you are raising your voice and making a point and um, before we yes. move on are you able to give us sort of one practical example of something that has changed as a result of, of, of that change in the board composition um yes absolutely um we have managed to organize a women's forum last year and the example was taken by the women leadership forum organized by european hockey federation but because we we actually were given this place on our board in polish hockey we were able to just suggest it and it was very well accepted and it was organized and it was accepted by the public uh, really greatly and appreciated and many women were able to share their stories share their experience and hopefully motivate others and and inspire others to take actions brilliant well thank you very much for that um we'll, we'll come to you cohen next you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep it gender equal we'll go female male female male so cohen your your experiences yeah well my my experience are uh, mo mostly uh, on the pitch uh, where i was um uh well in the in the in the lucky position to umpire some uh, some ladies games recently and in the, in the last couple of years um and also seeing more and more um female umpires umpire in the in the in the men's uh, competitions and uh in in the men's league here in in holland as well and what you see is of course they they the the female umpires they bring in different energy uh, on the pitch, which is very uh, accepted by the, by all the players, uh, and 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 I think it's it's a good thing that that now nowadays uh, more and more uh, games are officiated uh, as well on and off the pitch um, with mixed genders, and um, I think that's a that's a very um, uh, healthy uh, evolution for the game and uh, I, I think we we, we we should do more um, more more of that on on any level uh, to make it more acceptable and and to make uh, to, to, to make uh, everybody know that guys this is this is normal it doesn't matter if it's a female umpire or a male umpire there are two umpires and they they are there uh, appointed to, to do the best game that, that they've ever, ever done so the the more the the acceptance is is getting higher and higher. It's getting more normal, and I, I think that's the beauty of our sport as well. That that we are just doing it, and and it doesn't matter who's who who's officiating it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's it's not part part of the sport, and people are are uh, are mostly asking if uh, if if there are not uh, mixed mixed gender appointments. Why why isn't that the case now? And and so it's getting more more and more known. And I think that's the beauty of our sport. Yeah, and I, I mean, a couple of points on that. The first one is um, straight after the first match where um, I think it was a um, Pro League match down in um, Auckland, the first uh, mixed gender match, speaking to the athletes afterwards, they said it was absolutely no different. You know, there was absolutely no difference at all. And I think the thing that we can cascade down to um, leagues and clubs and regions and all that sort of thing is this is very possible to do because it's being done at the top level so you know we're, we're in a world where there are umpire shortages if you can call on a wider pool that is all brilliant isn't it so uh, yeah true yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and, and and again there is no difference you know we, we there we we apply the same rules the same interpretations uh it, so it, it so it doesn't matter it doesn't yeah. matter and, and and there's that great community i mean again watching international matches you can really appreciate the great communication between the umpires and and again we all speak the same language don't we so that you know that this is this is brilliant really really good exactly yeah that's yeah. agree thank you very much for that um Ugni, your your experiences 
Um, yes, I'm very happy to actually add uh, a little bit different uh, view on that because I'm coming from the small hockey nation, uh, different than uh, Spain, Netherlands and Poland, which we have here. Uh, Lithuania, to understand how small it is, uh, it's better to speak a little bit about the numbers. So in Lithuania, we have a total of 800 people who are associated with hockey. So 800 is the number what we have. Out of this, it's 12 hockey clubs and eight sports schools where hockey is played. So these, these are the numbers which we have. And um, still in the highest level of the executive board, we have nine people from which eight are male and one female. So for the highest level, it's changing slowly, but also um, the change is a bit slower because of the capacity and the people we have. So this is one of the challenge. But another side is that uh, in the different levels, so regarding the players, regarding the youth, regarding the volunteers, the gender balance is um, much better. And um, it's more, let's say, 60-40, uh, still male dominant, but, um, but the women and the girls are there and very ready to, you know, learn and go through the process to get at the end to the executive board. So I guess from the small small hockey nation, a little bit different. Uh, dif we are in a little bit different uh, place rather than you know the challenges which uh, my colleagues are bringing here to the to the panel. For us, uh, the first step is of course to maintain and assure that hockey development is there, that we can attract as many people as possible. But at the same time, of course, it's assuring the good governance and that with the new generation, it will be more equalized and more energy and motivation to continue till the executive board. So these yeah. are the moves we are having here. That's brilliant. Um, so do you think in some ways it's almost an advantage having a smaller cohort, smaller number, because people have to, by necessity, get involved, don't they, to make sure that things happen? Indeed. I think uh, the privilege we have is that definitely everyone who is in hockey has a hockey in the heart. Everyone has so much passion in it and uh, they work hours and, of course, they put so much volunteer time in it to assure it's there. And uh, in that way, uh, the changes are a little bit easier to make because you can have people on board easier because everybody knows everyone. <laughs> so it's, it's much easier to make contact and agree on things um, or at least to introduce new things. Do people like reforms that fast? Probably no. There should be a strategy how you introduce reforms and how you, you know, go from one uh, very extreme point to another extreme point. Of course, it's a step-by-step -step process. But uh, knowing everyone and having this privilege of uh, having people who really love hockey and are motivated and put the volunteer time in it helps a lot. Yeah, sure. Just my final question on, on those numbers of nine males and one female on the board. Is that likely to change? I mean, is there openness to change for that? Um, Yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Uh, what do I mean by that? Because, uh, of course, for the executive board, it's an election process. So in one way or another, it has to be uh, the organizations, sport clubs and, and uh, committees who have a voting right to actually change their position um, to whom they vote. So I believe that in that area, the perception is changing, meaning that they would be more open to have a good candidate rather than it's a male or female candidate. You know, it's a preference for the good specialist, good professional. Uh, but at the same time, why it's not changing that fast? It's also what I said, depending on the capacity, we don't have so many people stepping in for election. Yeah. So there are not too many candidates to step in. And for that, um, where we will talk a little bit later, I believe on the process and the good practices. So one of the good practices we really want to do here is more mentoring process. Uh, European Hockey Federation is also highly involved and has been involved in, in this mentoring program for the last three years uh, to assure that the young people, or not only young, but the women, let's say in this case, would have a little bit mentoring and would be a little bit more motivation to actually step in in the position before we actually go for election. So this is where we're working on that. So to have a motivation and encourage people to step in. And then the next step, of course, will be to vote for it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And as you say, we'll pick up on some of those points later. Um, Sergio. What's what's what do we like in Spain? What's happening there? Uh, well, uh, I came from uh, from a little bit different background uh, since Spain is probably not the biggest uh, hockey country, but not the smallest. It's not Lithuania, uh, but I came from a um, from a small club in the middle of of Spain, and I I've played for uh, ten years uh, more or less, and the thing is that in in Spain in general, in, in my city in particular, it's either you go professional and you are 100% involved in playing or 
there's no that much that you can do that you can feel that you're a part of a community because you can volunteer and I was coaching kids and I was doing stuff but I felt that something was missing uh, and when I had the opportunity to go to the EHF Youth, Youth Festival uh, in Antwerp in 2019 I felt like there was more people in the same position as me and I saw that either girls or boys uh, there was people that like to be involved whether you were a player or not so that was really refreshing for me to see and I think I always uh, come back with learnings from those webinars like this one or, or activities like the youth panel that I'm a member now uh, I always come back with with some lessons that I can apply to my own club and my own country so that's always great Brilliant. And, and what's the sort of the, the gender balance within your club in terms of running things? Have, have, have you got a, a strongly balanced club or is it is it pretty male dominated? Um, in terms of playing, I think in general hockey is a sport which does better than others in terms of, of being uh, gender balanced. Mm. But I think we still have uh, some lessons to, to apply in terms of managing clubs, uh, which some positions are still uh, really male oriented, yeah. not for a specific reason, but I think we will probably touch on this uh, later as well. I think it's not always uh, that you don't want that to be the reality, but you have some things that condition you, which can be unconscious things that you don't know about or, or, or even cultural uh, mm -hmm. shapes and forms. Uh, so it's always a little bit about taking a step back and, and, and seeing where you are from an, an external point of view. Yeah, sure. And as you say, we're going to pick up on, on several of those points in a, in a few minutes. Um, just before we move on from this question, Cohen, I just wondered, um, hockey is leading the way in terms of uh, mixed gender umpiring. Have you been approached at all by other sports to ask how, you, how we have gone about doing this? Unfortunately not, and it is quite a shame because just two weeks ago in Holland there was a in football there was a Lions a girl I think Lions yeah Lions uh, woman uh, yeah Lions woman sorry uh, who, who who was the first Lions woman in Dutch football who uh, who was officiating during a men's game and it was big news you know big news all over the papers the national televisions everywhere. And I thought, well, guys, this is something that we're doing in hockey for the last decade. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we, 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 we also must be more proud of something that we are, we are doing, but we're not advertising with it. And, mm. and, and so maybe we, we're a bit, a bit shy on, on, on this to promote our sport. But so I, I, I found it funny that uh, in, whenever it's in football, it's a big thing straight away in the news, in the news online, everywhere. And in hockey, we're doing it. <laughs> for decades already and 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 no, nobody knows so i think that's that's also a task for us here in this in this uh in, in this webinar in this in this group now that whenever there is this, there's something uh which you can use to promote the sport within your country use it yeah. use it and and so unfortunately i was not not uh, contacted by any other sports but uh, hopefully that will come uh, uh well in in the future yeah sure and i think that's the first learning point really for everybody on this webinar as you quite rightly say Cohen go back to your clubs go back to your 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 counties go back to your your national associations and shout about the fact that we're leading the way in this respect and and also embrace it as a change um just a, a philosophical question to chuck out there to all of you really why is it important why should we have a gender balance within an organization what does that bring and I know that we've got lots and lots of 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 answers to this um but if we just come around and get a couple of ideas from each of you um and if i come to magda first you know what why why is gender balance so important to me personally gender balance is very important because it it makes the organization more approachable to the public to everybody that is involved and that cares about that particular sports that you're involved in i mean imagine if you see a board of 10 men or only 10 women uh, or to compare a board of five men and five women, which one is more approachable to, to which one more people would try to reach and try to find that person that could answer my question. Uh, I mean, the variety and the diversity is just so healthy in order to, to improve and to develop our sport and, and uh, the way we organize it that it just be it should be natural that it's diversified and that it's 
mixed balance, mixed uh, gender. Yeah, so diversification and diversification of ideas, yeah. approaches and everything else as well. Um, Ugne, what are your thoughts on that? I really like what Vanima said about external approachability. I totally agree with that. What I would add is the internal development. I think the gender balance group challenge each other and only having you know, the challenge in the organization uh, where we don't always have the same views or the same understanding, we can grow and develop. And I think it's so many researches already done in the area that the gender balance group has a better outcomes as organization development uh, because there are different inputs and different understanding on things. This is what I call challenge and the development of organization. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, put the challenge out there. We've also got to make sure that people listen to each other as well. And it's not just words floating into the ether. Um, Cohen, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, you know, it, this, this uh, yeah, it's uh, I think it's, it's, it's very necessary to do. And um, and, 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 um, and and just to to uh, energize everybody within the club or within the, the national uh, association um, to, yeah, to to let everybody know that this is possible, and, you know, and and all the examples what Magda and uh, Ugne, sorry, it was uh, Ugne, sorry, um, tells you to to embrace it and to and to implement it as as far as possible with, within your own organization. Sergio. Yeah, for, for me, it's the obvious thing. The question here would be, why wouldn't you want a, a board that is equal in, in all terms, not, not only in terms of gender, but it, the, the more perspective you have uh, tackling to a problem uh, regarding what Ugne was saying about internally uh, fighting different problems, uh, the more perspective means the more more solutions to a, to a single problem from different approaches. So that that's always good. Yeah, Th there's one thing I'd just like to add to that, and that's it's something that's personal to me. Um, I joined a board a few years ago and I was the only woman on it at that time. And that was an incredibly difficult thing because I couldn't see a role model for me to follow. So it was a, it, it was a diff and so I think that having women on a board means that other women within a club or within an association feel more confident about putting themselves forward because they'll know there'll be acceptance and, a, and another voice as well. So I think everything that you've said is brilliant and I think we can chuck role models into that into that mix as well. Um, the barriers, and I think this is probably the, the thing that we will we will get so much from. If we talk about the barriers that we face as um, organisations in achieving gender equality, and I think I'd like to come to Magda first because she's she's got an idea already that we've discussed we've discussed offline in terms of motherhood and how that affects things. So Magda, for, if you could just talk about sort of the challenges that motherhood presents to being able to, to fulfil a role in a, in, a, in an administration. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that to me personally, the biggest barriers to uh, reaching gender balance were people themselves, because uh, we we meet different people on our ways to achieving goals. And if you meet a person that has a very strong approach to, to gender balance or imbalance, uh, it's just so hard to break this person through. It's just so hard to make them think differently, to change their habits, to, to make them see you as a person wanting to achieve the same and not as a woman. And especially when uh, the challenge of motherhood comes to women, it, it, it is really, really difficult to make, make others realize that this is not an obstacle, really. This is something that is natural and everybody else that cares as much as we do as moms should support, not even help. There is this thing that I never understood even coming from my friends when they say that they ask their husbands to help with the children. Um, how about you ask your husband to help you? How about they ask you to help you, to, to help them with, with yes. their children, okay? Or how about you don't help each other, you support each other because you both deserve the same chances to, to, to just live your life the way you want to. So as long as you meet the right people and you surround yourself with the good people and eliminate the toxic ones that could try to tell you that you shouldn't or you should, um, you're on a good way. Mm. Do you think there needs to be a rethink in the way that things are organised sometimes to make it easier for parents with children? I'm talking about men and women here. You know, if a meeting of an administration takes place at eight o'clock at night, that's not very conducive to family life, whether it's the father or the mother 
uh, who's having to go to the meeting. Do you think we need to fundamentally rethink the way that we run some things to make them more family friendly? Um, well, yeah, obviously it would be very helpful, but then again, once you have this passion for something, you always find a way. You always find a way. You just, uh, the desire that me personally, I have inside to 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 be in this hockey world and to to continue this adventure, to now to share what I have been given by other people, um, just makes me find a way always to to meet uh, whether at 9 p.m. or at noon. Uh, like right now, my children uh, are supposed to be home because there's no school on Wednesdays here, but they're not because I have arranged something for them. So I guess there's always a way you can find. Yeah, and as we saw earlier, perfect example of Mike bringing baby Noah onto the call and, uh, exactly. and getting involved there. Yeah, um, great. Um, Udne, what, what are your thoughts on, on barriers to, to gender balance? Um, I think I will follow up regarding the, some changing and procedures. I think there, in general, we have quite a lot of uh, election procedures or getting into the boards or you know decision making bodies, or not only decision making bodies, but also in, in uh, some other um, organizational structures. But we have this challenge sometimes that there are some criteria which are not uh, possible, neither for men or sometimes neither for women to step in. That those could be, I don't know, the nomination letters from uh, your clubs or etc., or uh, 10 years of experience or, you know, something which is very hard to reach. And sometimes even the ones who are just starting and haven't been there for, for ages and uh, to keep the gender balance, the new ones cannot come in. So the change is so long and etc. So the procedures in general could be one of the challenges and uh, where we can think about it, if we can change it in one way or another to have a gender balance. What you said, Sarah, uh, it was very interesting for me. Then you stepped in uh, to be the, um, in the board as a first female. For me, it was the same. I stepped in as a fir first female chair. Nevertheless, the board was uh, women dominated. So the highest position was uh, male dominated. So we changed that. But then the board itself was actually women dominated. And had, I had to work opposite to assure that the gender equality is not from the you know, women empowerment in this case, but the man empowerment. And I think I always want to, to remind that for ourselves when we talk about gender equality, it's not only about women empowerment, but also about men empowerment as well, to assure that it's equal. And in that, I think uh, a lot of things are related to the volunteer positions as well, or um, compensation or motivation for compensation. Uh, so this is one of the challenges, how to think that the people who are going to, to volunteer for hockey, to be hockey coaches or 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 um, I don't know, um, being the trainers, umpires, being in the board, not all of the positions are paid. Some of them are volunteer. So how to keep the, uh, the challenge is how to keep the motivational system that everyone would be ready and, and you know, ready to step in. So we have a gender balance there as well. And maybe it's not going you know, from, uh, from the big nations, uh, but from the small nations, I think this is one of the main challenges as well, how to keep the motivation there. Yeah, and I, I mean, again, a, a couple of really good points, but also some follow up questions, really. Um, you talk about keeping, um, you know, pe people interested and motivated and it might not necessarily be payment, but, uh, you know, how do you keep people wanting to umpire, wanting to turn up and coach on a Sunday morning? Um, and a little bit of that, I think, perhaps comes down to offering a professional pathway to those people. Um, so, you know, you, you you start off coaching level one, you get some support from your club or from your association to move up to level two. And so there's professional development. I wonder if I could throw that question to Cohen, you know, as, as someone who's in the umpiring world, how do you keep those people motivated and coming back for more? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good uh, question and issue, I think, all over the world. Uh, and and we also don't don't have to forget that maybe in some cultures it's more diff difficult to get the gender balance than in, in others. And so it, um, don't expect uh, massive changes overnight, but step by step. You mm -hmm. know, and sometimes it's, it's, it's also good to, um, while Cedric is, uh, is turning in from India. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, no, but but you know exactly as you say. Um, if if people uh, find it difficult to, uh, well, for example, maybe a young girl umpire a a, a boys game uh, um, at, at the club, give them the support that they that they want at their level. Um, mm. You know, and 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 show them how how it's done. And 
um, and, and, sh and give them advices on their own level and, and also um, inspire them just to, uh, just to make it very simple for them uh, and show them how, how things are, uh, well, can be done on the pitch. So give them the advice and give them the help step by step. I think that that will keep motivating them and to uh, to let them see and let them feel that that um, no matter what game they are umpiring, they are capable of. And yeah. it, you know, it, it it doesn't matter. It, it's the same for for a boy, for a young boy uh, umpiring a, a, a girls' game. You know, it it it's, it it will develop your own uh, umpire skill. Uh, to to see different different games different uh, uh, levels of, of of hockey that will only build uh, build you as an uh, as an umpire and to 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 let you grow because every game is different you need different things uh, different emotions are there um, every game so it doesn't matter which, which game you're umpire and uh, this is my my own experience as well it doesn't matter which game which level you umpire but it will make you a better umpire to understand which tools you need at, at, in, 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 in which game and what kind of game. So uh, d during the, uh, the education of young umpires, give them the tools and show them that, that of course, uh, maybe at the club, the, the, the boys' games are more exciting to umpire, but that, that will not build you as an umpire. That will not develop you as an umpire. You need to have all different levels of umpire, of, of, of games, sorry, to, de to develop yourself as, as, as an umpire, to, to, to give you the tools which you need for, for each and every game. Yeah, and I think we could extend that. So, so offering opportunity and then exactly. offering the support and the training to get people to take the most of those opportunities is something that we, we as clubs and associations, can extend from umpiring and coaching to all levels. You know, if you're going to be the club financial officer, you need training and support. If you're going to be the club chair, you need training and support. Um, Sergio, uh, just a slightly sort of left field question for you. Um, you know, I, I keep going on about your youth. You are the youngest person on the call. How is it for young people trying to get into positions where they're involved in administration at the club whether it's male or female you know how, how easy is it for a young guy or a young girl who's very ambitious and wants to get involved how easy is it for them yeah i, I think it's uh in in some terms uh, kind of similar to what coin was talking about uh, umpiring because at the end it's all about having support and having some people and some tools that you can use and you can and you can talk and you can have them as a, as a support. I, I like a, a, a quote that says leadership is empathy. And for me, that's it. It's about you're talking to a little girl that's uh, umpiring a boys game. OK, maybe for you it's not such a big thing, but you have to understand that maybe for that person is or maybe you have a person that wants to take a, a role in, in organization in a more more ambitious position. You have to understand and really put yourself in, in that place to how would I feel because okay I, I know what I know and I feel how I feel because my DNA and my surroundings and, and, and how I was I was teached but if literally I was a different person with different DNA and different beliefs and different traditions and I was from another culture I was probably going to do a different thing on, or going to worry about different things so for me it's all about empathy. Great that's yeah that's a great answer. Um, so our ideal person on a board encouraging other people in would have lots of empathy and would be offering lots of opportunities. But what are the I mean, have, we, have you got um, good practice examples, all of you, of how things are being done well and things that you can share that, again, uh, people listening to this this webinar can take away and use for themselves? I think um, Ugna, you, you mentioned mentoring. So I don't know if you want to talk about mentoring a little bit or, or whatever else you'd like to talk about. Yes, I think uh, this is a perfect follow up what uh, Sergio was saying regarding the, you know, having the support. So in Lithuania, we started Youth Leadership Academy exactly for that reason, uh, to assure that uh, we start at the young age so that we lead, you know, through the process and we assure gender equality and also the new position. Basically, it's, um, it's a one year program. So, you know, it's not one time, but uh, sustainable so that they have more support during one year. And um, we have 12 different topics which we talk about. All of them related with hockey. So either it's uh, coaching in hockey, either umpiring, either how to be the best player, how to play for a national team, you know, what do we need and etc. Uh, to even how to start hockey business. Uh, so it's a very varied topic. So everyone can find a way where they want to be related to the hockey. And this is exactly the mentoring program and support. 
so we always have uh, the specialists from the area from Lithuania as a start. Uh, so the good coaches, the, the ones who started the business or about empires and etc., who share the story, who share the main tips, uh, who share the very practical details, how to start to do one or another uh, thing from the very young age, and then to support it through, through the system. So basically one year program gives us an opportunity to introduce for uh, 40 young people in Lithuania how to do the first step uh, to being in the system of the hockey. I call it the system, it's not a very nice word, but basically how to be there as a coach, as umpire, as an administrator, and etc. And this is what, what we talk about, the mentoring. And I totally agree with Sergio Meshed that having the support as a first step is very important because then you feel more secure, you feel more um, there in the position and you know how to start it very practically. So this is a very interesting practice I'm happy to share. Brilliant. Just a, a quick question on that. How easy is it to find mentors? I mean, do you find people who are keen to do that? It, it is quite easy in our case because uh, there are not too many people in a way. And uh, all of them also, as I said in the very beginning, love hockey. So they are very ready to be there. And we, uh, I think this is very important also to very clearly mention how much timing and how, what kind of uh, you know, expertise they will need to bring in. Because every one of us are planning our time. And if you say, okay, be the mentor and just be there, whatever it is, and it doesn't work that well. But you would say, okay, you're going to have uh, one meeting per month for, I don't know, two, three hours. And maybe one uh, or two, you know, calls, short, short calls with a specific person, then it works uh, quite, quite better. And at the same time, there is another example, which is coming from European Hockey Federation. What they did with the mentoring is uh, having the mentors from another business sector. So it was not uh, people from the sports sector, but from the business sector. So we, maybe this is also one of the idea. Why don't we mix uh, sectors? You asked this question for Coin regarding do other sports organizations taking an example? But maybe this is another question. Can we take example from other sectors, from the business and et cetera, and bring it back to hockey? Maybe yeah. that's also one of the solutions. And, and also that could be a two-way process. So yes, mm -hmm. you go to the business sector, but they might come to you for some mentoring from a sports perspective as well which would be great cool thank you very much indeed for that um magda um have you got any uh, you know best practice examples that you can share with everybody um i was thinking while Ugna was talking and uh, i'm gonna go here with an example of a person that uh, nobody really knows uh, she has never given an interview, she has never been on TV for anything, she has never been an official mentor on a seminar or a webinar, but she's a mom of three children. Uh, one of these children is a, is a girl, and this girl has been playing in a boys team in a hockey uh, club Stella Gniezno in Poland for quite a few years. She's the only girl on that team, but the phenomenal thing about it is that it's never brought to anybody's attention. She's a team member as anybody else. And the fact that my friend, her name is Evelina, she's bringing her daughter to these practice sessions. She's taking her, she, she's just letting her play the game that this little girl loves, is such a wonderful lesson to both this girl, to all the other boys in this team, that I really keep my uh, fingers crossed for uh, little Nadia, because I think with an education like that, by her own mom, she might become a really great leader one day in the future because she's just growing up in in this environment. And uh, I just want to give a huge credit to the mom, my friend, to the club for letting this happen like naturally. There is no, there's really no stress on it. It's just, it's just an example of how little changes can be made and how uh, ordinary people, I should call, could be mentors without giving official lectures, uh, just by doing what they do. And they should be brought as examples to others uh, that these little actions can be really very meaningful. That's brilliant. I mean, two things there. Let's hope that Nadia goes on to represent her country um, in, in hockey, because that'd be fantastic. But yes. equally, there, there is no glass ceiling. She has no can, no perception of a glass ceiling because it mm -hmm. has been presented to her. And hopefully other girls will see the same thing. Thank you. That's, yes. a, that's, a, that's a great experience. Um, Cohen. Yeah, um, well, a couple of things pop up in mind. And, and I love the stories that, that, uh, that Magda and Ugne uh, just, 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 just told us. Um, but, you know, I think it's also uh, giving, giving uh, in my case, young umpires trust that, that they can do it. 
that they are able to uh, officiate a game which they maybe is, they, 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 themselves they, they think, well, it, am I able to do it? And giving them trust and to uh, um, just to just to show that they're able of, uh, to to um, to umpire that game. And there was and, and there was a, a younger girl the other day, uh, the other week, sorry, uh, where I was umpiring with. And I was yeah, am I able to umpire this level of, of game? Yeah, of course, you, of course you can. And and but why? And it just it's, it, it's all trust. And mm-hmm. I, I think you know, I, I, and, and giving them the, the 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 right feedback and the right words to to gain trust during the game. I think you know, and and and, and also in the in the own development to show them that they're able to umpire a younger uh, 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 any game that that they want um, is it's it's so um, yeah how, how do you call it it's, it's giving them self confidence that they are able to and of course it, it, it in the beginning it, it might be a bit of uh, exciting and maybe uh, uh, n- n- that they are feeling not not that they should be there but in the end. Giving them the trust and to show that they're able of and they're they're capable of um, umpire at, at that level that that you will see that they will grow during the game and during the season and that's that's something uh, that I experienced myself with with well with younger umpires boys and girls actually so uh, yeah that's the example and I th- I think as well again that can be extended across every age group and every every situation because if you're given the trust by the board, by your organisation, by your team, whatever it might be, then you will have a chance to flourish. Um, Sergio? Yeah, I was thinking uh, about what Conor was saying, and I think um, it can be applied to be really uh, direct and and, and, and pragmatical. Uh, I would say it's a two-step process, uh, with the first step being uh, take, a, take a step back and listen, but active listening to what people are trying to say, because what people say is not always what they are trying or what they're intending to say or what they feel. So, for example, you can ask why a couple of times when someone says something to you. You're gonna okay, wh- why are you using this is like this? Uh, and another tip that I think it's it's really helpful is try to be a blank page. Don't have any thought about what the other person is saying. Don't think what the other person is talking about, how you're going to, to reply to that, or no, I know this person is saying this because he's thinking that. Try to be a blank page. And then when when you have to talk or want to, to give some advice or want to be helpful, try to have in mind that not all the people have the same type of communication. And usually we talk how we want it to be talked at, so that's not always the case. So some people prefer more direct communication. Some people prefer more subtle. So have those two things in mind. Yeah. So it's actually a case of self-education as well. Educating yourself to hear uh, what what is actually being said, both both verbally and non-verbally. Um, I just at this point, I'm just going to cut in here with a quick message from Trisha from Guyana, who said, "Good morning, all. Enjoying the discussion. Our board reached 50% gender balance at this year's election. So I think." Well done, Tricia, and well done the people at the Guyana Hockey Association. Uh, Really, really good news there. Um, Just to move on from what you've all been saying, I think one of the things that that, um, links everything that we've been talking about is perhaps a a, a cultural understanding of a gender balance as well. So it's not just about, um, yes, okay, we know that we need to get this many people on the board. We know that we need to get this many uh, female umpires onto onto our panel, but it's actually... Um, recognizing the, the benefits and the advantages and also using language which allows people access um, and I, I just wondered if we could just um, briefly think about um, culture and sort of the gender stereotypes that we find within our culture um, and I'm going to give you I, I'm going to go for a quick uh, a quick um, one here most of the committees that I ever come across the chair is normally a man so it's great to see Ugni on the on the uh, call today who is a female chair of the board that's fantastic but there does seem to be a little bit of a concept a a perception that on a board the top jobs and by that I mean the chair the treasurer sometimes the secretary as well it does tend to be that's the positions that that the men seem to find themselves in sometimes not by you know not through their own their own want but that's that's how it goes so that that for me is one example of of a of a gender stereotype that I think we have it within our power to change I just wondered if any of you and I'm not going to 
pick on anyone. I'm just going to say, have any of you got examples of gender stereotypes that you think within our culture we should be making steps to change now? Maybe I can follow up with you. Uh, this one, definitely, that the highest positions are led by men. But related with that, the one we quite often hear back here is that women don't want that themselves. And, uh, you know, from the researchers and, and um, other things, we see that it's not always the case. Of course, there are women who don't want to be in that position, and that's totally fair. But uh, this is a very big assumption and um, very hugely spoken out loud that they don't want that themselves. Why should we do that? So I think this is one of the quite big stereotypes we have still here. Yeah, but, def definitely something to be questioned. Yes, yeah, sorry, go on, go on. No, no, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and that's something that I find interesting. So, but... Uh, are are they being told or uh, that they're able to to do it, then, or is it or or is it kept that, that way? Oh, this is a good question. I think it's just in general, the there is no questions asked. It's just you know what the, the people in the board, let's say, are saying. Yeah, nobody wants wanted to step in, so they don't want to be here themselves. Rather than you know checking, okay, but maybe our procedures are not good and they're not allowing them to actually step in. So what you are what you are asking? So I think it's just statement without actually you know checking in with anyone. Yeah. yeah. So so you you are changing that then? Oh, we do <laughs> trying. <laughs> I mean, it's it's step by step process, of course. Maybe uh, what what Magda was saying also about the silent road models. I think in that case, the person who was not you know stepping in and speaking, uh, sometimes we need the the role models who are very out loud. So that they would change. No, but the situation is different. You know, I want to be here. Uh, the colleagues I have also want to be here. Um, and it, it, you never asked us. So let's yeah. now please hear us. And we want to be there. Oh, true. You know, and, 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 and th that's some, something that, that I can relate to as well. That so, uh, uh, sometimes you hear, yeah, but that, that's not a job for me. Or that is not th that's something that I can do. Or, you know, and, and, and then you're going to explain what the job is and then mm -hmm. what the background is for the people who, who, which we're looking for. And then, oh, right, so this is quite interesting then. So, you know, it's, it's also, I think, to, for, for, for any organization or any committee to, to show what exactly needs to be done. And, and instead of, yeah, we, we, you know, so explain what you're doing and maybe then a, a broader audience is, is there to, uh, to fill up the gaps. And um, yeah, j j just say and tell what you're doing. That's something, um, yeah. Yeah. Sergio, is it something that um, education should be playing a bigger part in? You know, should, as Magda pointed out with the, uh, with the example of uh, Nadia, you know, actually, if you show that anybody can do this job from an early age, then there is no glass ceiling for anybody. Yeah, I think, uh, and I speak from my perspective, of course, but I think uh, younger generations don't don't see that as a big problem or, or that something that could be so problematic, at, at least on a, on a more surface level. Because, OK, if you're not teach otherwise, why would you think there's not equal opportunities for, for women and men? That's nonsense. But still, there are some 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 areas in which uh, let's say society teaches you and it's like an iceberg in which the part that you see is like of course equal opportunities for everyone and we want everyone to have the same opportunities but then if you look a little bit closer and you dig a little bit deeper you see that there is a more complex problem and it's, it has more layers to it. Mm. That is such a good point. You know, yes, and, and it actually brings in, I, I, I asked a question ahead of this show about um, what, what we call tokenism, where you're told that you have to have so many of, you know, what, whatever the diversity might be on a board. And so you tick the box to say, OK, we've, we've got this person, we've got that person. But are you actually in danger then of missing out on skill sets, on, on ticking all the skill sets? So I don't know what anybody's thoughts are. I mean, Ugne, you're, you're nodding, so I'm going to take that as a sign you've got an opinion on this one. Yeah, I agree. I think um, sometimes this is the question of and, and the debate regarding the quotas coming in also, you know, this tokenism is so, so in a lot of cases related with the quotas. Should we add some quotas in, in you know, in the you know, umpires, in decision making bodies and etc. Um, I don't have a very, <laughs> this is a very big debate. I don't have a very uh, hard position myself regarding it. I think in one case, it's in the specific countries, it helps because it's the first step when you have people and then, you know, you develop. Yeah. 
on the other cases, um, and my personal opinion in, in total is that, of course, first we check and look at the persons and what they are bringing and uh, what we can bring as an organization to them. And the most important is the personality, person and qualifications the person has. doesn't matter what kind of gender gender identity it is. And it's still, you know, now we're talking about male and female, but um, in nowadays, the gender identity is broadening up and there's yeah. going to be so many other gender identities. We're going to talk about it. So, you know, this is a very, very interesting about tokenism. And I think that shouldn't be there. Uh, is it easy to change? I think it also depends a lot of the person around us, the people involved. Yeah. Factor, any thoughts? Yes, uh, just to follow up uh, of what Ugne said, um, I think honesty here plays a huge role. I think once you've got an honest person uh, choosing their boards, it has to work because uh, honesty leads you to look for people who share the same pa share the same passion uh, that in the end will lead you to some great solutions and decision making while if honesty is not really something you're looking for you just want to tick the boxes this has no chances of surviving for a longer time this is just um, this is just fake and I, there's no point in doing so no I just had a quick glance at the clock and I see that we're, we're this really, really intriguing discussion is actually running out of time. So I'm going to ask each of you, um, if you were to offer, I'll speak slowly so you've got time to think about it. If you were to offer one piece of advice on how an organisation or even an individual can work towards achieving um, a greater level of balance within, within their organisation, within their life, whatever it might be, what would that piece of advice be? Um, and I, I actually missed out the word gender then, because as you quite rightly say, it's not just about achieving a gender balance, it's about achieving a diverse, inclusive organisation across the board. So a sterling piece of advice from each of you, who would like to go first? I'll go first if you want. Go for uh, it, Serge. For me, I would say uh, in, in, in ecologism and, and trying to be sustainable, there's the term uh, greenwashing that is used for, for brands that just want to appeal greener or want to appeal like they're doing some stuff. And I think sometimes you can apply the same term, but, but in terms of gender balance. So I would say my, my, my advice is would, would be whatever you do try to make it so you convince people it's not it's not a race it's not a competition it's not that about winning it's not to tokenization for me uh for, for me it's about ensuring that what you're doing even if it takes you a little bit more time it's about making it sustainable and the, on the only way to make it last long is that you are sure about it and you have conversation about it and everyone is convinced about it so whatever you do have some some thoughts and and is the only way to, to a sustainable change. Brilliant. So have your thought, have your strategy and take the team with you. Yeah. Perfect. Magda. Um, what I would like to suggest um, is that it's really worth allowing changes because changes makes us take actions actions make us keep going and we we just should keep going following the the what's what's happening in the world and uh, not discriminate people because of who they are uh, allowing them speak for themselves not trying to think for themselves for them brilliant and i'll just go, circle right back to something that cohen brought up at the very very start not just that, but actually celebrate when those actions are successful as well and tell the exactly. world about it. Yeah, exactly. so yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Cohen, if we come to you next. Yeah, I think, you know, the world is changing. The world's changing. And I think in, in, in a good way. Um, everybody can uh, can be who, who, who uh, whatever he, she or he wants to be. And, and I think it is um, it's to develop their own talent um, it, it's only it, it, it can only be done if, if we support and giving the, the opportunities to everybody. And you know if 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 you are able to support um, uh, and accept everybody who is just uh, mm -hmm. the, the way they want to be, they then your own organization will grow and uh, and, and and so you will be a leader uh, in um, in in that way. And I think people who want who wants change and who wants uh, to be part of that organization, 
um, we'll we'll look in the future if you're uh, if you're um, if you're able to adapt as a, as an organization. Mm -hmm. And so, if it is a, a hockey organization or a club or a any any other uh, 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 yeah, part in the hockey world. If if we are not able, if you are not able to 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 uh, to support the change, I think then in the future will you, you you will have a difficult time. So accept the change and accept everybody uh, who who and whatever they are, and uh, and experience the talent that they can bring to your own organization. Uh, that's yeah. that's something. And uh, yeah, the other ones. And I I think what's very very true um, is that. An open, accepting, accessible club will attract open, exactly. yeah, yeah. accessible-minded people as well. So you'll have a, you'll have a meeting of minds and, and and grow and develop and flourish as a result. Great, Ugni, can you finish us off with something amazing? Yes, I can give you two very practical things. Have a strategy. Know with what kind of procedures you have to change, with what kind of people you have to talk, with what kind of program you want to develop. And another practical example: give time, invest time. So maybe set in your agenda one hour per week where you actually concentrate only on gender balance, only on developing your organization in that way. Very practical in your agenda, then that hour is for that work. So do practical things one hour per week and you see that after some time the changes will be there. That's brilliant. Well, to everybody listening, um, I, I think there's been some fantastic discussions, some fantastic practical ideas to come out of this. And I think all four of the panellists are quite happy for anybody who wants to to contact you, to chat ideas through. Um, you, you can go through the FAH or through the EHF. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm just going to hand over to a, um, a woman who has been trailblazing in terms of leading organisations um, from, from national, international, continental. So, Marika, it's over to you. And thank you very, very much indeed to the four panellists today. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, all of you, for your input in this discussion. Uh, you have no idea how you have inspired me by listening to you and all the wise things you have said. Uh, and uh, Sergio, I would like to say to you, if if you are such a youth leader, then you have a great future in front of you because you have so well understood what it's all about. And all of you, but Sergio, I say especially because he is the youth leader and the future is, of course, very important. What, what, what I like to summarize what I heard is about support, about each other, about role models, about listening. Uh, and it makes all clear that you can't do it alone. You have to do it to do it together. Uh, and with each other, I think we can make the world a little bit more pleasant for everybody. Indeed, we have to accept people as they are. We are all equal and we show that all, everybody is equal. Uh, I'm really impressed by what I've heard. Uh, I'm looking forward, Sarah, to the article you will write as a kind of a summary what what hurt and i hope that other people uh, uh will will can use it um what i like to say to everybody you don't have to be uh, experienced or educated or whatever uh, uh, age you are everybody indeed as katie started can make a change and everybody uh, can take care for a difference so don't wait if you have been inspired by the people around the table, do it in your own way, what you think is the best in your environment. And what uh, Ukne said is, I think, important. Take the time, think about it. Just don't jump in it, but think about what for you is special and how you can change it. Thank you really very much to all of you. And Sarah, you did a great job. Back to you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Very, very much again. I'll just reiterate what Marika said. Thank you so much for the panellists, but thank you as well to all the people who've taken the time to listen, uh, to comment. And as I say, do keep the discussion going um, and, and we, will keep, we will keep working very, very hard towards gender equality and equality across the board. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been pleasure. a pleasure for me.